To another in the continuing series of Impact webinars, we really appreciate you showing up today for this value-added event. Today, we're going to talk about the legal challenges that have been presented by the global pandemic, COVID-19, and how they've affected our job sites, our employers, the iron workers on the job sites, as well as how that impacts us legally uh, and our standing between our employers and their customers. Today we have, and we're very pleased to have with us, Vince Bosworth, the president of Bos Bosworth Steel, based in Dallas, Texas. Joe Pizzakimi with Berlin Steel. He's a vice president with Berlin Steel, based in Berlin, Connecticut. And our attorney, Michael Scholart with Baker Donaldson. Um, before we get underway and listen to these three experts and how they uh, interact with uh, the very hyper competitive construction market and the influences of this pandemic legally on their commercial arrangements, uh, I want to do some housekeeping and talk a little bit about our build program. Uh, first, the housekeeping. We don't monitor the, the chat function. Many of you have been on our webinars before. We do, however, monitor the Q&A box. So Michael and Vince and Joseph will provide uh, a crisp 40, 45 minute presentation and we'll open it up for questions. You can ask those questions at any time you want just by typing in the Q&A box. Again, we won't be monitoring the, the chat function. The other piece is is we record these webinars. Uh, many of you have known who've gone to our website, all of our past webinars live there, as well as the PowerPoint. I've got permission from Michael, Vince, and Joseph to allow you, the viewer, to download and reference this PowerPoint uh, later on, uh, noting well the legal uh, legalese that prevents you from doing anything nefarious with the content, right, Michael? <laughs> and um, so you can look for the recording of this, this video, as well as uh, the PowerPoint being uploaded at impact-net.org, either later on today or tomorrow morning. So it'll be there for your ready reference. Um, a word on the build program. So. You know, if you go to the Impact website and hit the Programs tab, you'll see very many different programs. We created this build program to allow our contractors that are struggling, uh, or startup contractors, or anything in between, to be able to tap into subject matter experts. For instance, today Michael is an attorney that we work with at Baker Donaldson. Uh, and you'll see the scope of, of their practice. But we also deal with insurance firms, bonding company, uh, finance related, and we also have a uh, small business expert in the form of Carrie Walters. If you go on the build tab of our website, there's a two minute video on that. And all of our regional directors work very closely with all of these guys to make sure uh, you get the service you need. We realize that our contractors are a valued and prized commodity. Uh, that's how we put iron workers to work. And uh, we're very happy to help them in any way, shape, or form. <clears throat> if you want to get in touch with one of these subject matter experts or Carrie Walters, reach out to your impact regional director and they'll give you the proper advice and stuff to go through. So with that, gentlemen, thank you again from the bottom of our hearts for uh, coming on and sharing your time. We know you're very, very busy. Uh, and I'm sure you'll jump off here and go on to your next Zoom call. But with that, I'll turn it over to Michael Scholart, and uh, he'll go through the agenda. Then uh, we'll go to some self-introductions. Thanks again. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that introduction. Um, so in, pre in preparing for this webinar, um, Joe, Vince, and I, had a few calls just to ex, you know, exchange our experiences and the impacts of COVID-19 from Vince and Joe's perspective um, you know, in the office in the field and then my perspective in advising clients on legal issues. And we've come up with an agenda today to discuss you know, market conditions, um, travel restrictions and executive orders, 
um, operational impacts, uh, legal challenges, um, and then we're going to you know, finish up with uh, risk mitigation, what you can do to help kind of avoid some of the, the risks and impacts uh, from COVID-19. It's been a, a pleasure speaking with uh, Vince and Joe, and I, and I won't do them any justice by introducing them, so I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, Vince, if you want to talk about uh, yourself and Bosworth Steel. Sure. Um, thanks, Michael, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today, taking some time out. Um, Bosworth Steel, we're a uh, steel erector based in Dallas, Texas, um, founded by my dad, John, in 1995. Um, we work primarily in Texas and its surrounding states, but we will travel a little bit for our best customers. Uh, we have a very small group of core customers, and if they ask us to go somewhere, we will try to try to do our best to follow them where they need us to go. Um, we are a full service steel erector. Uh, we we primarily our primary expertise is in structural steel, but if a customer wants us to do Full package, mist metals, precast, the whole thing. We'll we'll take that on. Uh, just whatever our customers need us to do, we'll we'll take it on. Um, 2020 is a down year for us, and I'm sure most of the people on the call are down hours down in hours this year. But we typically run between about 700 900 thousand man hours a year. Um, most most of which is in Texas. Thanks, Vince and, and Joe. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone, for being here. So I work for Berlin Steel. I'm a uh, division manager, our Connecticut division manager. Our company is comprised of four divisions. We cover the North Atlantic coast. And um, as I said, we're centered in, in Connecticut. Uh, throughout our offices, we have about 160 in-house employees. Pre-COVID, we were about uh, 300 iron workers. Uh, we're slowly building back up to that area. And like Bosworth, uh, we are primarily an erector. We do some fabricating and uh, we offer, try to offer a, a turnkey service as well. Great. Thank you, Joe. And, and as Kevin mentioned, my name is Michael Scholart. I'm a shareholder at Baker Donaldson and I am in the Baltimore office. Um, Baker Donaldson has been working with Impact through the BUILD program um, for, I believe, about two years now. And we can you know, offer a range of services um, from corporate structure work, uh, labor and employment, uh, contract review, collections issues, and mechanics liens, and then uh, the, the gambit of construction issues as well. Uh, myself do um, you know 99% construction work. I'll dabble in, in labor and employment, but certainly know when I'm getting over my head. Um, I, we, you can see the uh, these are our offices. We have 23 offices, mainly across the southeastern United States, um, but we ha work um, nationwide and internationally um, with other things. So. Um, it's been a pleasure working with Impact, and we look forward to growing the relationship in the future. Uh, so the, the first topic uh, that really came to, to Vince and Joe in my mind was, you know, market conditions. You know, Vince mentioned a little earlier that it's been a little bit of a down year for Bosworth. Um, so I thought maybe, you know, he could talk a little bit about what he sees in the future um, for new opportunities in the current environment. Sure. Um, I think before we talk about new opportunities, we can kind of talk about what markets have gone down in 2020. Um, what's not getting built right now. Uh, aviation is way down. Obviously, not near as many people are flying. So big additions to airport, big renovations, that, that work is dried up. Um, uh, anything to do with an office, new construction or renovation, uh, until companies figure out exactly where in-person officing is going. Um, there's a lot of people working remotely now and it seems to be working really well. So um, I, I don't expect to be building any new office buildings anytime soon. Um, in-person retail is down. I don't know how much that's COVID related and how much that's gonna keep going once once COVID's cleared up. Um, you know, people have gotten really used to buying stuff online. Um, and higher education's down. They're they're not having the revenue that they normally have. 
uh, I expect that'll bounce back pretty quick. Um, and although it's not a market that we participate in, we've, we've heard that the industrial market, at least in the Gulf states, is way down uh, as far as man hours go working in those facilities. Um, so the markets that are up, the opportunities that are out there, um, the uh, distribution centers for large online retailers, they're all confidential, but everybody knows who they are. Uh, those are popping up everywhere. They're huge tonnage jobs, huge square footage jobs. There's a lot of man hours in those. Uh, there, there's a lot of that work available, and I don't expect that to stop anytime soon. Um, data center work is really, really strong. Um, and it's not just the big confidential clients that everybody knows. There's also small, um, smaller, you know, 300,000, 400,000 square foot data centers that are popping up. Um, that that's really good work, really good structural steel work um, that's coming on board. Um, we don't, we haven't seen a huge increase in healthcare work right now, but we do expect that, especially in the next in two, three years, a lot more healthcare work coming up. So there are a lot of good opportunities coming up. Um, you just gotta, if you only build, you know, airports and offices, you probably need to start looking for something else to build and, and pivot and sell some work. Right. And Joe, just kind of speaking of new opportunities, has the way that uh, that Berlin bids jobs or any of the pressures surrounding um, bidding, has that changed at all in the COVID environment? Yeah, it, it sure has. Um, lots of pressure. Competition uh, is, is really getting stiff. Um, you know, depending on which market we're talking about, we've seen some, some pretty big downturns in New York. Uh, what we're finding is we, we as a company are fortunate, our, our market is a little bit spread out and we could take advantage of fluctuations. But what I've seen is where there are certain uh, companies that are beholden to a certain area, they, they rise and fall with that market. And uh, a larger company has, uh, like us, has a, a little bit more flexibility. We can, we can leave the poorly performing ones and, and try to concentrate on the better performing ones. So. So maybe to um, kind of add to uh, what Vince is saying, new opportunities may be new areas for some people where, where things fare a little better than, than your usual playing field. Great. Vince, have you seen anything in your RFPs or otherwise about, you know, allowances or alternates to, to address uh, COVID issues? Um. Yeah, I think that that comes with a somewhat unstable market. Um, 2020 was, we had COVID. We also had an election year. Um, the the lending on a bunch of these big jobs um, might not have been fully realized. A lot of times when you put your proposal out and you have all these different breakdowns, um, line items, a lot of times we just say those are for, you know, accounting purposes only. They're breakouts. That It's not a shopping list. Um, but they, some of the bigger jobs that has turned into a shopping list for contractors and owners. So you really need to be careful when you're, when you're developing those breakouts that the contractor may, or the owner may elect not to build the full job and whatever your quote is for the part that they are gonna build, you need to be good with that. Or you need to have a big caveat and bold letters at the top of your proposal that that is not necessarily a breakout price. They can buy only that, um, I mean, talking with Joe and we've seen it down here too. Some bigger jobs have gotten broke up to where they buy fab and erect from multiple bidders on different parts of the same job because combined that's a lower number than one single bidder on the whole job. Um, so it just like everything is tightening up in our industry, the, the money's tightening up um, upstream from us. So they're trying to get the best deal they can for their building. Um, so whatever you're putting on that proposal, you need to be very acutely aware of what the dollars are and you need to be good to build whatever you're putting on that proposal. Right. And in my practice, you know, I represent owners and, and general contractors as well as subcontractors. And I've seen GCs push owners real hard to address, you know, COVID and the pricing of a job. Um, some who are you know, most are very reluctant, as you mentioned, to kind of entertain pricing related to that. I have some, seen some, you know, provide allowances for cleaning, deep cleans. If there's an outbreak on a project, there are things like that that's out there. Um, so, you know, my only 
plug here and I'm going to plug it again later is, you know, for all the, the, the subcontractors and suppliers on the phone is make sure, you know, you, you get a copy of the prime contract. And if you can see how the job's broken out and see what any allowances are, that, that could help you. Um, so this, you know, kind of our digital world, Joe, is, is, is fine for us sitting in our offices and, and doing webinars, but how about when you're trying to, uh, you know, go out and get new work or, or sell yourself um, after you submitted a bid? How has that changed? Yeah, that that has not uh, gotten better. I can tell you that we we really miss uh, visiting the client, sitting down with the client, uh, selling the job, selling ourselves. There, there's just there's a connection there that just you can't get on online. It, it, it just isn't there. And, um, you know, try as you might, you have um, your scope meetings, and as Vince had mentioned before, that you know nowadays it's turning into multiple scope meetings. Um, you're you're just left with uh, the impression that, geez, I wish I could have been looking that person in the eye and uh, trying to close a deal, and it, it's 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 not there, and it makes it very difficult uh, on jobs that are committed. Uh, that, you know they'll buy it anyway, and they'll buy the price and that sort of thing. But but it's it's nice to have that connection when you can get it, and that's rare nowadays. So that that's that's uh, that's something that we're trying to learn to uh, live with and work around. Right. And Vince, I'm sure you're you're selling jobs over Zoom as well. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, or at least kind of talk about what your experience has been with respect to, you know, from time to, to bid to uh, inking a, inking a contract. How, how has that been? Um, it's slow right now. <laughs> I think uh, it's it's slower than we've ever seen. Um, Typically this time of year, especially election year, a lot of people don't make a lot of moves between Thanksgiving and, and Christmas and after the, you're going to get those awards after the first of the year, but um, it's been like this since April or May and, and jobs that we would typically see get awarded in um, 30 or 60 days. Those are, they're, they're dragging out. There's, I've talked to several of our fabrication customers and there's jobs they have laying out there that they have the good old warm and fuzzy from the contractor, but it's 90 days out and uh, there still hasn't been an official award to release detailers or buy material or release an erector or anything like that. Um, I think we might talk about the price of steel a little bit later, but the price of steel going up pretty dramatically here of late, that might be able to pull back that, that uh, lead time on cutting a fabricator loose, um, hopefully, uh, and, instead of keeping us kind of with all these pending jobs out there. Um, it's very difficult to plan your work if you have six pending jobs or 10 pending jobs and you can only sign a, a percentage on how likely you are to sell the job. Um, it, it, it's much better to have the actual verbal or the, the award. Um, so I, hopefully that gets better um, once everything kind of stabilizes. But right now it, it's taking a long time to get actual awards after data bid. And have you had any jobs since that have been canceled or delayed? Um, yeah, we, we had two aviation jobs cancel. Uh, luckily, we hadn't started on either of them. Um, so it, there wasn't a big fight over money or um, anything like that. We did have a lot of jobs delayed. Um, delayed starts on jobs that hadn't started and then delayed jobs that where the jobs were shut down midstream. Um, there those the, those jobs that were shut down midstream there there is a large cost element to that uh, luckily we have good relationships with our national rental guys um on crane rental on equipment rental um so you can work a deal out with them to stop rent and not demobilize all the equipment and you know it's great to have those relationships but that's not the same for everybody so um trying to collect money that you're out on a delayed project it, it's it's very difficult. We're going to talk about, uh, Michael's going to talk about your contractual rights there um, on delayed projects and canceled projects. But, you know, it really just comes down to a business decision whether you want to pursue that money because that money has to come from somewhere. It's either coming from a contractor, it's coming from an owner, and they're not really getting much for it. So um, it is a business decision to pr pursue those dollars. Um, but, you know, that that's something you have to weigh out. Yeah. 
And, and Joe, Vince had mentioned uh, price fluctuations in steel. Have you, are you seeing that in the Northeast as well? Yeah, yeah, we are. The um, one of the things that we found for our area, and when prices go up, they go up for everybody. They go up for the essentially the entire country. And we've seen the price of steel go go up, as as everyone has been aware. But the markets have not done the same up here. So that, that's a, that's another added pressure that we have to deal with. Um, on the brighter side of that, the uh, architectural billing index are it, it is slowly creeping up. It, it, we're still below a 50, but it's uh, it, it's it's got an upward trajectory, and um, you know, we're hoping that the the market is going to uh, react favorably to uh, the election being behind us. We'll see how this uh, rollout of the vaccines are, and, and maybe. Have uh, developments uh, owners with developments that uh, are, are on the back burner, put them to the front burner. Uh, jobs that have been stopped, awaiting uh, more favorable conditions, start up again. So that I'm, I'm, right now, the even though the prices are going up uh, of our materials and the prices of the jobs seem to be going down, um, I, I can see where it's, where current trajectories are going to show that that's going to uh, improve here and, and hopefully we'll see that by the second quarter of next year hopefully. right and so i just wanted to follow up on a, a few of the things that, that vince and joe talked about and you know what i'm seeing from you know the, the legal side of it i don't think this will come as any surprise to anyone um, but it's good to reiterate i mean the, the contracts that you all are signing are almost always fixed price contracts. Um, we, we know, you know, the industry says that 53% of the rebar used across the globe is produced in China. Um, China's faring much better now than the United States, but if the, you know, a second wave were to hit China, um, you know, you could see even greater increases in steel. Joe and Vince are seeing those increases now, but, you know, you, everyone I'm sure always has an eye on the market for that. You know, lumber prices, um, not so much in everyone's industry on this phone, but those are through the roof as well. So in the absence of an escalation clause or de-escalation clause, the subcontractor's taking the risk of price fluctuation. I've included on this slide, and I'm not going to read it out loud, but everyone's going to have access to it, is you know, a, a price escalation clause. If you have enough leverage that you're lucky enough um, to negotiate it, that, that, that's some language that you can you can use. Um, I would say good luck to you because I'm not seeing any owners or GCs for that matter that would accept similar language for that. Um, but you know, it, it never hurts to ask, I guess. And sometimes if you don't ask, you don't ever get anything. So um, it's also important to keep this in mind on bid qualifications. Uh, I think you know everyone's spitting lots of you know bids chasing work these days you know it, it is important to include a qualification in your bid to say how long you are willing to hold your prices for and that might be you might want to tighten that up a little bit um, in this market um, so that you know you don't have a bid out there that's sitting out there um, for some time um, prices go up and then you see a GC you know try to grab on that um, and we'll talk about another concept in a minute about, you know, about the submission of bids and being held to bids. Um, but Vince mentioned uh, projects getting suspended and canceled. Um, everyone probably understands the concept of a termination for convenience clause, which essentially allows an owner and then downhill, a, a GC is allowed to do it too that allows them to terminate your subcontract or your purchase order for no reason at all um, or, or for any reason. Now, there is some case law out there in various states that says, you, you know, owners need to act in good faith that they can't, you know, basically terminate a contract just to jump on a lower price elsewhere. Um, so there is some case law out there that if you think you're getting terminated for to go with another subcontractor, you might want to think about looking into that. Otherwise, if an owner wants to or a GC wants to terminate your contract, they're generally going to be contractually entitled to do so. 
And I've put language up here from the AIA A401, which is the standard form of agreement between a contractor and a subcontractor. Um, joked with uh, Vince and Joe the other day, if anyone ever gives you an A401, you should grab it and sign it as, uh, as quickly as you can because a subcontractor is not going to get much more favorable terms than what the AIA points out. And so in, in point of fact here, if you look at 7.2.2.2, I might have put another point two in there than needed, um, but it says that in the event of a termination for convenience, that the subcontractor is entitled to receive payment for work properly executed, costs incurred by reason of the termination, and reasonable overhead and profit on work not executed. You are generally never going to be able to see the reasonable pro overhead and profit on work executed. That's just the market's not out there for that. For some reason, the AIA is leaving it in. Um, you're more likely to see tailored or manuscript clauses in your in GC subcontracts that really restrict your rights. Um, I'll put another one up here. I've, I've kind of highlighted this one's not only a termination for convenience, but allows a suspension as well. Be careful about that language because if someone's entitled to suspend you, you can again write in, you know, run into the uh, the, the price escalation issue. So you know you want to kind of be careful about the language, read your contracts before you sign them, um, and look at the rights that are there. But the big kind of picture takeaways here are at a bare minimum, you need to be entitled to be compensated for your work in place, your, your earned revenue. Um, if the project started, it's also reasonable um, to be looking for your costs of demobilization or any other termination costs you know, restocking fees. I don't know that that really applies in, in your industry, but uh, those are the kind of things to look for. The suspension, making sure that you're at least being paid for what you've got into the job so far. Um, and then the final legal concept is, Joe, Joe mentioned kind of some of the bidding pressures and that, you know, people are really looking to build backlog right now and where, you know, the projects where he was experiencing two or three other bidders, you might have 10 bidders on it. And, you know, people out there are hungry and I'm sure people on this webinar are hungry. Um, but if you're putting out bids for, you know, lots of bids, probably a lot more than you could actually perform the work. I just want you to be aware that there is a concept out there called promissory estoppel or detrimental alliance, where if you submit a bid to a general contractor and they reasonably rely upon your bid and rolling up your bid into their bid to the owner and they get awarded the contract, even in the absence of a signed contract between you and that general contractor, there are circumstances where they can hold you to your bid saying, no, you told me you could perform this job for a million dollars. I'm expecting you to do it. And if I have to go back out in the street and spend $1.2 million with someone else, they're going to be looking to you for the $200,000 difference or potentially much worse. Um, so, you know, again, that goes to the issue of qualify your bids, make sure you're including language, how long they're good for, you know, and whether it's reasonable, um, you know, to rely upon that. So, we're going to switch gears now. I think we're all understanding that we're into the, the second wave of, of, of COVID that, that everyone was anticipating back um, this summer. Um, I know that, that Maryland and even you know Baltimore City is starting to put new restrictions on it. And you know, and plus you've been dealing with uh, restrictions to date. And Vince, if you can kind of talk a little bit about, I know that you're working in several states and, and how that's impacted Bosworth. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, our core is in Texas. Our core group of guys, the supervision um, foremen, they're mostly Texas iron workers. So Texas has a ton of cases. Uh, we have a big population, but we also have a whole bunch of corona going on down here. So not every state is very friendly for people traveling from Texas to their state. Um, some require a 14 day quarantine period. So uh, that, that kind of presents several problems. One, if you're sending supervision or iron workers out of state to start a job, uh, depending on whatever the state is, they might require a 14-day quarantine period before your employee can go to work. Um, and that's not something that you can necessarily look ahead and see. Uh, until these numbers start declining, which they're not, 
uh, those can pop up any time and you don't have a ton of time to plan for it. So um, it also affects around this time of year, everybody wants to come home for the holidays. Uh, you got to make sure they can get back to wherever they were coming from, or you have to have a backup plan in that state that you're working to make sure that you're at least have somebody on site to run the job. Um, also the management oversight and, you know, follow up with your customers, nothing beats boots on the ground management on a job site, uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, whether it's, you know, the definition of an iron worker saying something's done versus DDFD done. Those are two different things. And sometimes you have to see that with your own eyes. Um, a phone call to a customer to make sure that everybody's working safe and that we're meeting turnovers, that phone calls aren't always the best. Sometimes a job walk and is better with a customer. Um, you can just do a lot more on site than you can over the phone or over Zoom. So, um, you know, it, 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 in the states that you're working where quarantine period is required and, you know, it, you essentially can't go see your jobs, you need to come up with innovative ways. You need more pictures coming in, file sharing software. Um, you, daily reports need to be uh, more clear, um, more information, whatever it is, because if management's not seeing these jobs, um, you, you might need more detail coming in from the field than you would have otherwise. Yeah, and then, you know, we kind of note job shutdowns here, and, and Joe, I don't know if you want to piggyback on anything Vince said, but, you know, also, you know, back in, you know, March and April, I was on the constant lookout for executive orders um, with, on whether, you know, work could continue. Maryland, uh, thankfully, it never was shut down, um, but just up the road in Pennsylvania, Governor Wolf shut down construction projects for some time. I think Boston, Joe, was a little bit of the same, and, and I know the Northeast tends to be a little bit more strict, so I don't know if you have anything to add to it. Yeah, I think it was because I, I think the numbers up here were, were so high for so long. Um, we, we had a, a kind of a general shutdown in, in a lot of our areas, um, but in several of them, because uh, construction was deemed essential, we, we were able to get back to work. The, the complications were um, maybe having some of your equipment stranded, as Vince said before. We, we had one particular job where we wanted to go get our crane. We, we wanted to get it off the site and uh, crane people were willing to go get it off the site and they, and they refused it. They, they would not let us on the site. A case like that, um, we're gonna pursue those costs because in, in, in my view, that contractor made a conscious decision and we could have taken that equipment out of there and still complied with all the regulations that we needed to warrant anybody at risk to do so. So if, if you have conditions like that where it seems like a decision is made that exceeds uh, the CDC requirements or OSHA requirements, that sort of thing, you, 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 may, have, you may have grounds to um, get some recovery on that. It, it'll be a fight and, you, and then you have a business decision to make if you want to invest in that fight. But um, where apparently arbitrary decisions are being made that are costing you money, you definitely want to want to be on top of them. At least do what you can do to mitigate. Um, after the shutdown period was over and we got back to work, and through I would say this point, it's been almost normal. Um, we obviously have the additional PPE for the guys. The biggest thing being uh, the masks. This time of the year, it hasn't been too bad, uh, but. Over the summer, especially in, in some of our southern areas, it was pretty rough on the crews, uh, trying to keep that mask on and sweating underneath it and that sort of thing. Very uncomfortable for them. But to, to everyone's credit, they, they hung in there and they did it and they did it admirably. Yeah. And you speak of masks, um, so operational impacts of, of COVID, uh, you know, can you talk about the uh, Berlin's experience uh, with respect to, you know, safety measures and, and morale issues and how you've seen that change? Sure. Um, at, at the beginning of all this, uh, I think everyone experienced the same thing. The, the PPE was a little tough to get. The hand sanitizer was difficult to get. Um, our safety folks had some pretty good uh, rapport with with our vendors and we were able to get some favorable um, 
access to some of these items and that helped us out immensely. But even with that, it, it, it was difficult and it was kind of a difficult startup. But once that was in and once we had confidence that we would have the right, um, the right materials and the right PPE to protect our people and we had controls on the job, whether we made the controls or some of the more responsible GCs put together some, some pretty reasonable controls. Then we saw that our crews reciprocated with a lot of confidence that you know they they they, they knew that we had their back and and they could work with with, with some reasonable assurance that look we, we really care about you guys you know, we do, we don't want you to get sick we don't want you to to, to bring anything home and, and spread it to uh, uh, elderly relatives and that sort of thing and it, 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 it with an extra personal touch to the attention it, 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 I think it, it it went a long way and and uh, and our morale improved, um, visibly improved as time went on, and we were able to get uh, these controls in place and work with Bob. Yeah, and I think that's, again, I'm gonna plug the, make sure you're looking at the prime contract issue again, because you wanna make sure you know what job site controls are, because you're gonna be complying with that, and there might be a cost to that. Um, so Vince, you want to talk about, you know, costs of it and then, sure. you know, take it into to delays a little bit as well. Yeah. Um, the, those hard costs there, the hand sanitizer, PPE stuff, you know, that's, it's kind of a drop in the bucket. Joe's going to talk about the cost of productivity here in a second, which is the biggest cost. Um, but you know, there is an additional cost and we can kind of call it new scope of COVID. Um, each each contractor, each owner is going to have a different COVID safety plan, which is above their normal health and safety manual or whatever. Uh, but you need to, if it's a hard bid job now that you're looking at now, you need to understand what the plan is and what they're allocating for you to cover. Um, is it 15 minutes a day for temp scanning? Um, how many times per day are you required to clean? Um, those are all man hours, and, and that is the biggest additional cost. It's not just loss of productivity. It really is like a new scope uh, that you need to pick up. So uh, be aware of what's in those bid packages. Um, on the delays, um, you know, our outbreaks on jobs, job shutdowns, we've been really fortunate. Most of our work, we, we haven't been doing a ton of renovation work, but most of our work's outside. Um, early on, uh, April, May months, there are there was full job shutdowns for five days when it was a possibility of a case. And I think that settled down a little bit. It's compartmentalized a little bit. So um, we're optimistic that that's gonna keep continuing to be an efficient process if, if there is cases on a job. Um, material deliveries, long lead items, especially from overseas. We were talking in one of our calls, one of our jobs required cables coming from Germany um, and they needed to deliver on site in May. So that was, you know, it, that kind of stuff, not only do you need to be uh, notify your contractor that there could be a potential delay, but you really need to be on top of those long lead items, be working with your fabricators um, to make sure that there aren't some of those big impacts because if it if it does shut you down, then it turns into a whole fight over cost. Right, and Joe, Vince mentioned productivity. Why don't you, oh, why don't you touch on that? Sure. The um... The office, the productivity, I, I, I'd say when um, uh, Connecticut had their shutdown and we, we tried to get 50% of our people uh, minimum to, to work from home and, and we did and uh, we made provisions for, for setting up uh, computers and things like that and everybody really did make a good faith effort and tried to stay productive. But uh, there again, like the deficiencies in trying to sell a job remotely there are deficiencies in trying to run a company remotely. Maybe, maybe some of these internet companies or some of these other startup companies um, can do that. I, I, I don't think it has a place in our, in our field. Um, within the office, uh, there are some that are probably a little better towards uh, remote work, uh, duties and responsibilities than others, some of the technical items, detailing, engineering, that sort of thing maybe management I, I i don't think so i think uh, if you try to manage a job remotely you lose the camaraderie you lose the connection with your fellow workers and you lose that knowledge base uh, sure you can call them up you can send an email that sort of thing but you can no longer just walk down the hall and pop in somebody's office with a question that sort of thing um what is the impact from that that's anybody's guess but it 
it is not a positive one. Um, out at the site, the uh, like we touched on already, uh, I think the PPE is is a big thing. Uh, the the check-ins, as Vince mentioned, some jobs are better than others. Um, we had an interesting one-on-one -on -one project where uh, access for inspectors. So you normally you get in the, the cab of the, uh, the lift, you bring the inspector up there, and he does his thing. Uh, that didn't work so well. Uh, we had some of our guys that just didn't feel comfortable bringing an inspector up. That you know, they they don't know they don't know the guy. They don't work with the guy. It might be a guy they never even seen before. And we had to work our way around that with with respect to our people. And, and that and that that is a, that's a valid concern. So you had, you had little things like that that you might never think about that were coming up. And you, know, you, you got to half step backwards and and make sure it's handled properly before you can get your half step forward again. So the little hits uh, throughout uh, and all, all you can really do is try to foresee what you can foresee and as things come up, be flexible and, and try to come up with some reasonable mitigation. Yeah. And, and so, you know, getting contractually and legally um, to talk about some of the delay issues and, and productivity you know, everyone's heard the term force majeure, um, fancy word, what's it mean? It means, a, you know, a delay that no one anticipated or expected. So that's, you know, what you're typically looking at. If you are having delays um, related to COVID-19, you're going to look for the force majeure clause. This is the A201 force majeure clause. Uh, people are typically putting COVID under the highlighted um, sub item three there. Um, but as I mentioned initially, and, and you know, Joe and I were talking just today, is you know, is COVID, uh, you know, is it unexpected? Is it unusual? Um, it, probably not now. So the contracts that you signed um, back, you know, in February of last year, COVID absolutely is not uh, something that you anticipated. Um, but now, you know, we're in a COVID world, so you, you, you know, need to take a look at the language of the clause you know, at the bare minimum, you should be entitled to time, um, but not money. And I think that's the general rule that, you know, we're seeing you know, the construction lawyers out there, you know, the argument, unless you can make some argument for changing laws or otherwise, but, you know, you're most likely if COVID delays your project, you're going to get time, but not money. So a related concept out there, everyone's familiar probably with the no damages for delay clause. So, you know, it's going to be in your subcontract or your purchase order. It says if you're delayed, you know, for any reason, your, you know, sole and exclusive remedy for that delay um, is going to be an extension of time. Uh, it is, you know, unenforceable in some states, um, but the vast majority of states and no damages for delay clause um, is enforceable. There are some exceptions to a no damages for delay, probably not COVID related. Active interference is probably the most heavily litigated exception to a no damages for delay clause. Uh, but the realities are in this day and age, and again, unless you have some leverage um, as a subcontractor, um, that you're going to be faced with a no damages for delay clause and you are going to be entitled to a time extension um, but not money. The, the same thing is probably going to go for the productivity or inefficiency issues um, that, that both Joe and, and Vince mentioned. Um, the no damages for delay clauses that I'm seeing in most uh, you, you know, subcontracts these days are not only saying for delays, but it's saying your you know, sole remedy for in project impacts, um, productivity losses is also an extension of time which is a little bit of an oxymoron if they're accelerating you and, and causing you to work at the same time to meet schedule. Um, so Joe, I, you know, you've been reading some industry um, publications about what they think the impact is in the field at all? Yeah, there's, there's numbers out there. It depends who you talk to and what, what day, what day of the week it is and what direction the wind is blowing. It, numbers between, you know, 15 uh, or 10 and, and 20 percent. You probably hear 15 more uh, more than ever, than than any other number. But I, I I have to 
I have to have some doubt at the scientific method that's <laughs> gone into putting those numbers together. I, I, th this is a new thing for everybody, and I, I'm not so sure that as, as long as it's been already that anybody really has their arms around it, other than to say it has definitely had an effect on, on everybody's bottom line. Yeah, and I know we want to save a little time here for, for Q&A at the end, so I'm going to kind of speed up a little bit, but I do want to talk about if you are experiencing, um, you know, inefficiencies over and above on a project that, that you think you might, um, as Vince put it, you know, you know, re relationships aside that you feel you need to pursue the claim, um, there are generally, you know, three ways to pursue an inefficiency claim. One's called a measured mile analysis, which is an empirical methodology that compares your production on an unimpacted, um, uh, you know, an unimpacted schedule versus an impacted schedule. So if you've got a period of time where you're, you know, erecting steel and, and nothing's bothering you, that's your unimpacted period. You compare it to your impacted period, um, whether it's COVID or something else, and you're spending more man hours to do the same work that's inefficiency that's causing you more money um, there's something else called the mcaa factors put out there by the mechanical contractors association it's been around for a long time um, but it's got some um, some pretty um, insightful analysis even on covid um, and basically you apply these factors and calculate productivity from there and then there's also the total cost or total modified total cost which is a disfavored analysis that says, well, my bid said I could do the, the job for this much, but it cost me um, more, X plus one, and, and you owe me the plus one. Um, so if you're gonna pursue the claim, again, review your prime contract, provide notice, document it, do a schedule analysis. If you need to, get someone involved. Um, and what I mean, get someone involved, get a scheduling consultant involved, and if necessary, get a lawyer involved. Um, I've, we've thrown up the NCAA factors on some slides here, um, just for you to kind of take home, look at it. I'm sure you'll be able to, you know, review these and, and see how even COVID is, is relevant to a lot of these. Um, we wanted to kind of close out with a little discussion about, okay, great, you guys are scaring me to death here, uh, if, if you're not already, but, you know, what are, you know, what can we do? And you've probably got one of the two best companies, you know, to hear from, from, from Bosworth um, in Berlin. So I wanted to give these guys some time to, to say what they're doing to kind of mitigate their risks in this environment. Sure. Um, I think the, on the planning side, just planning for COVID and keeping your employees safe, you know, one, do it because it's the right thing to do. Um, two, enforce it. You, you, you need to make sure that everybody is following the rules, keeping everybody safe. Um, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's healthy for the company. Uh, if you do have an outbreak on your jobs, it's going to cost a ton of money. It's going to cost a ton of time. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of reasons to keep everybody safe and healthy, but it is good for business to keep all your people there without a disruption. Um, if you are experiencing like we're experiencing, you know, probably about, working half as many or a little more than half as many man hours per year this week than we were a year ago this week, um, you should be doing better. You, you should be building better. You should be building more efficiency. You should have your best and brightest. Your project manager should know their job is better. Um, your executive should know everything better. That within, when there's less work, um, they should be able to focus more and get more done. You should be getting more done in the field. So, uh, tighter margins, you should be able to live within them. Uh, everybody just needs to step up just because you have half the work doesn't mean you get to work half as hard. Everybody still needs to be pouring it on. And Joe, what about from uh, Berlin's perspective? Yeah, the pl planning is king. Um, we, we always try to economize our jobs once we get them, squeeze every nickel that we can out of them. And now we, now we have to try to squeeze every penny that we can out of them. We'd like to we like to optimize for <clears throat> our field work, easy connections. Uh, we like to do the same for our shop work. Uh, and, and now it's, um, it, we have to double down on that. It, it, it's, it's more important than ever because those prices are tightening up. They're, they're not gonna get any better uh, 
around the corner and uh, you've just got to try to squeeze every little bit of value out, out of your jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been incredibly informative and I know we could go on a lot longer, but I wanted to make sure as promised that we have some time for the Q and A. So I think this is our, our best break point. Keep in mind, you can watch all this over again and we're going to answer all these questions. Uh, if we don't do it live, we'll get it to Michael, Vince, and Joseph and make sure that they have the opportunity to answer questions because they'll have the registration list that people can, uh, uh, so that they can hook up uh, with you folks afterwards. But uh, I'm just gonna read them pretty much verbatim. Uh, we just have a couple minutes left and we'll, we'll go as fast as we can. And again, the Q&A functions open up on, on the uh, presentation software. So. How hard slash easy is it to discern, discern between the COVID downturn and the typical four year election cycle downturn, or does that matter? Either one of you guys, Vince or Joseph. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. If you look at pre COVID, all of the indicators were looking good. I think, I, I don't think there's anyone watching right now that would say that we were in a bad market then. Um, and suddenly COVID hit and the obvious happened, we, we are in a bad market today. So uh, would the election have an issue? It, it, it would, I, I think it always does. Everybody just kind of holds their breath for, for a month or two every four years, but uh, it, this seems like we've been holding our breath collectively since March. Vince, your facial reaction was too rich to let this go by. What was your thought? <laughs> I like the or does it matter? Um, I don't know if it matters, but hopefully they're both the elections over and hopefully the uh, COVID's over soon. So hopefully it doesn't matter which caused it and we climb out of it quickly. Amen. Uh, next question. It's easy to understand how capital projects and the financing of the same may have slowed down due to COVID and or the election cycle. But have you seen your margins decrease regardless of volume? And which is worse, the decrease in volume or the decrease, if that's the case, in margins? Um, the, the decrease in volume, you, you, can still, you can still do fine with decreased volume. Like I said, you should, be, you should have higher margins with decreased volume. Um, I, I think the, the numbers are just going down because everybody's trying to load the boat, um, which is really that, that that's going to be that's going to be the bigger issue is the just the numbers are down, and it's it's just tougher to sell work right now. Yeah, I I, I fully agree. It's it's the decrease in margin that's uh, that you have to watch for. Um, with the decrease of volume, if if you have a situation where you're trying to make time for people, you know, they're, not, they're not fully engaged. If, if you are in a position to do so, now is the time to train. Uh, lean principles will, will say that uh, instead of um, trying to hunker down, uh, now is the time to improve. Uh, try to look at your processes, look at your softwares, look at your procedures and look at them the same way you might look at a job. Uh, is there something that we're doing uh, that we shouldn't be doing? Is there too much redundancy? Is there something out there that's better? Let's find it. Um, so I, I would have to say uh, the, the loss of volume is uh, not as alarming as the loss of margin. Excellent point and good uh, reference with uh, lean construction practices. The next question, is there a certain amount of fear, quote unquote, that many slash most of the pending jobs will be actually be given a verbal or formally awarded at one time and cause an issue for your firms to actually deliver on promises made? Yeah, um, if they awarded all of them in one day, you might be in a tough spot. Um, I think the, the scarier thing is if you, got awarded a ton of work with low margins um, and then had to perform all that work at those low margins that that wouldn't be any fun to do. <laughs> um, I, I, I would think I, if uh, what, what we try to do, we try to get, you know, just, just a simple email, just something saying, you know, not, not so much an, a, an, an intent to, to send a contract, but a notice to proceed. Those, those are, those are, those are two different things. And, and we try to push our, 
our clients to give us a notice to proceed that your price is um, is accepted or some sort of reference to the um, to the proposal and based on this price at least there's some tie that uh, you can rely on when the contract shows up and tries to put a whole nother uh, set of rules on, on, on your lap as, as happens often. So um, what, what, what we try to tell our people of just send me a, a quick email. We're good to go based on these terms. And uh, we usually kind of like to blame that on, on the, on the uppers, <laughs> on the upper management. So look, I can't cut your job loose until you send me this. Help me out. Gotcha. So, so we try to use that to help preserve um, what we believe the terms are at the time of sale. Sure. This is, uh, I'm sure, specific to Vince. Are the non-union projects just as bad in Texas? Uh, in a word, yes. It's, it's a struggle. Yeah. Uh, how often did Joe or Vince see standard AIA language in their contracts versus a quote standard contract from the client? And how often do they have leverage to strike through items which don't fit their business model? That's a great question. It is. The, um, I, it has been, I, I'm guessing, and I think I'm right, 12 years since I've seen an AIA contract. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. And um, the, the last one that I saw, if they're using the AIA document properly, there's an indicator on, on the uh, left margin of any edits that and usually there's an indicator on every other paragraph of an edit. One thing that I have or had found while I was seeing them is when you do get an AIA contract, it, it, it's, it's maybe an indicator of the type of customer that, you're, you, that you have or are gonna have. <laughs> and maybe they're a little, more, a little more fair, a little more equitable, and um, maybe it's a signal that you can try to negotiate some better terms and conditions. Vince, uh, how yeah. often can you strike through terms? <laughs> Very uh, rarely I'm, on I'm, terms and conditions. Um, I mean, you, you can mark up, you can strike through some. Um, the problem is that a lot of times we're signing a contract with a fabricator who has signed a contract with a GC who has signed a contract with an owner. So what good does it do you? Right. You're tied to all of them. The, the um, what, one thing, uh, j just quickly here. One thing that that uh, we find there's 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 two there's two schools on marking up contracts. You have you have uh, one set, if you will, of clients that are willing to discuss it or open to discussion on it, and you have another set that are profoundly insulted that you dare touch their terms and conditions. So it's <laughs> and it's always a dance between the. Okay, we're in the light. If I could jump yeah, in for yeah. a second, Kevin. I mean, when you do have the people that are willing to negotiate with you, it's good to get an addendum or a rider going with those people. So if you have repeat clients or repeat customers, instead of trying, you know, pick a handful of things that you really want to negotiate and try to get a standard rider um, that's going to plot all your work going forward. Good advice. Uh, lightning round, we're under a minute. As a small company, should we stay where we are size-wise or look to continue to grow in this uncertain time? Ben. Always look to grow. Amen. Joseph? I would do it as if it's organic. I, I, I would not try to force growth, especially right. nowadays. I would do it if, if you have an opportunity for a large job a little bit out of your uh, regular neighborhood or a different, uh, different market discipline, if you will, and, and it comes your way. Yeah, go for it, but I would not try to force growth. Not COVID 2020 related, but do y'all find a conflict between field optimization of connections versus shop optimizations? And how do you reconcile the two? That sounds like a complicated question to me. It is, it is. The, um, we, we lean towards the field because we are primarily an erector, but you know, we, we, do, we do some fabrication and we have to we, we can't we can't spend um, five thousand dollars to take care of some uh, column connections in the shop that's going to pick up two thousand in the field it, it's it, it's that kind of balance um, Vince you probably see the same thing when we do an erect only job that's a bit of a wrestling match you know, 
you want you want the type of connections that you want from the fabricator, and they all, always don't want to give them to you because it, it costs them money. Uh, but when you control both aspects of it, I, I think that you're probably better to try to make it better in the field because there's just less risk. You get a safer connection, a faster connection, get that guy off of that point and onto the next point. Yeah, and it takes a lot of trust with your fabricator if, if you're just an erector like we are, but if you really do each price what one of those connections would cost in the field versus the shop and you just do what the overall net cost is better for the job and just have that, you just have to have that trust that you're both being honest. Um, if it's a wash, then optimize it for the field. Um, always make it easier in the field. Trust is always a great thing. At that point, there are other questions. I'll forward them on to you guys. As a reminder, this presentation and the PowerPoint will be loaded onto the impact-net.org website either later today or tomorrow morning. Uh, you guys all did a fabulous job. Joseph, Vince, Michael, thank you very much. Uh, and stay tuned for the next Impact webinar as they continue into 2021. Guys, have great holidays. Be safe, be well, and thanks again. So long. Thank you. No problem.